if not for Joe Strummer of the class, I mean, I don't think any of this happens. I don't think I'm in Pearl Jam. I don't think I meet my wife. I don't have my kids. <laughs> I don't live in Seattle. I'm probably the assistant manager at Long's Drugs in Encinitas, California. And, and you know, could be happy. Probably still play guitar. But because of Joe Strummer, I feel like I've been afforded like the greatest life I've ever lived. <laughs> I was working midnight shifts for many years in a row, first at a, a kind of nice hotel in San Diego. That parlayed into a uh, supervisor job at a petroleum company. It was kind of a glorified um, you know, gas station attendant. But it was the midnight shift, and that made me realize that I could um, kind of moonlight for free <laughs> at a small club and town called the Bacchanal. It was uh, crushed into the corner of a very small, um, kind of a small strip mall. It, it had uh, like a 7-Eleven on one side of the club and a Tools R Us on the other. And the people that were coming into play were either, you know, kind of bands on the way up or bands that had, had been kind of up there in, in our... Uh, trailing off a bit, or, or not able to fill like a theater in San Diego. And they were also very cheap, and, you know, I, I saw if I could get a job kind of working crew, and they said yes, and, and that was great news. Um, but it wasn't going to be for pay. I, I could I could do it for free, and, and uh, you know, maybe they'd let me into the show free or... Uh, give me a couple tickets for myself and a friend or something. So that was that was the pay, but the, the real benefit was getting to be around music and getting to, you know, see what the lighting guys did when they set up. You know, see how the circus is, is put together every night. That stuff ended up being invaluable. And even if that whole songwriting or performing thing or... Even if it didn't work out, I, I felt like I was around the stuff that was most important to me, and that was live music. The listings would come out, and I remember uh, the palpable excitement to see that Joe Strummer was on on the list to play the Bacchanal. On November 21st, 1989, I had no idea that day really was going to affect my life in ways that no one, well, especially me, could not imagine. But it started with going early to sound check and bringing in gear and drum cases and pushing amps up the ramp and all this. And to this day, I mean, I really appreciate sound check sometimes more than a show um, because that's kind of where the real work happens or the real communication between band members and and they're doing it without the uh the eyes of a crowd so here was sound check but no one showed up except for the drummer and the drummer is jack irons i was a massive fan and follower of the red hot chili peppers and and there was jack playing um playing at sound check by himself so I said hi to him uh, as he was coming off the stage, and I think he asked if uh, we had any bananas. So I took care of the bananas, and, and then uh, I had a question because I had this bootleg tape of live chili peppers, and I couldn't tell if it was him or Cliff Martinez on the drums. So Jack said, uh, he said, I don't remember, but... Um, do you have the tape? And I said, actually, it's in my car. So he came and sat in my, my little Toyota Corolla, and within, you know, 30 seconds, he said, oh, no, that's Cliff. And how generous of him to kind of get into a <laughs> young guy, stranger's car and take a request to answer a question. I was, I was very grateful for that moment. So then the show comes around, the opening band, I think, was just a local band. They were putting on some airs, and, and um, I, I didn't really uh, 
appreciate it, and I, I don't think the crowd did much either, and maybe even the manager, but I, I think the manager, I, I told you they were a little bit cheap. I, I think he kind of stiffed the opening band. And what the opening band decided to do at that point was cut the power to the venue. <laughs> so now Joe comes out, I think he might open with London Calling, maybe two, three songs in, power goes out. Everything. And there, there's this this gig's, you know, this is packed. People just pushed up to the rafters and standing on chairs in the back and and then kind of moshing up front. But there's Joe Strummer, like right there. The stage was like waist high and there was no barricade. I mean, it's just like Joe Strummer right there. So now it's a little tricky. The Some of the crowd goes, you know, has to go outside. It's kind of havoc. And now there's a little backstage, which is slightly bigger than, let's say, uh, the inside of a minivan. And you got five, six guys back there, and um, and they need a flashlight, and I got the old flashlight. So Joe points at me, he says, um, he says, you, kid, uh, I need uh, I need rolling papers, 8D batteries, and my friend needs some bananas. <laughs> so I knew that was Jack needing more bananas, and I knew he, he, he and he had his uh, ghetto blaster there, and he, he started popping open the back and taking out the old battery. So I run to Tools R Us, I get the batteries, I get another flashlight, give that to them, and rolling papers from the 7-Eleven, and, um, and I'm just holding the flashlight over Joe while he rolls a spliff. And then he gets the ghetto blaster going. Jack's got his bananas. And, and, and the other guys are, are actually kind of going bananas, going, Joe, I think we just need to fucking bail on this shit. You know, it's been, you know, a half hour now. And Joe didn't want to leave. He's, he's like, I, I don't know. It's people, man. I mean, they came. And we had them. I, I can tell. They're good. We, we got to give it some time. And then after about... Uh, Probably an hour. Power came back on, and now it's probably almost midnight, and then he plays for like, you know, two hours, and incredible. Just incredible. So that was the story of uh, meeting Joe, and, and more importantly, meeting Jack. He was just a great, great human that took me under his wing. So Jack invites me on this camping trip, and um, this is kind of the summer of, I don't know, 89 or 90. Maybe it was 90. And and it's going to be like 10 guys in eight days, I think. On the way home from that trip, he put on this tape of this band that was the remnants of another band, and I'd heard of them slightly, I knew some of the stuff coming out of Seattle, but it wasn't like I was I was overly familiar with certainly this this band called Mother Love Bone. But we listened to it. We listened to it. Stone, Gossard, and Jeff Amon had asked Jack Irons if he was interested in playing in this new configuration they were they were trying to put together after the um, the rug got pulled out from them um, with this. Uh, well, the Love Bone thing, because the, the, the singer Andy Wood had a tragic mishap with some drug use, and so super sad story there, and, and they were trying to uh, rise from the ashes of all that, so they asked Jack Irons for some help, and he, he was committed to a band called Eleven, but they also said, and if you know any singers, pass it on, and he gave me the tape and that week I ended up um, writing a couple songs it's just like an art project so now I've got this tape I just play it all night and play it all night and then you know dawn comes and I get down to uh, this this little break in a place called Pacific Beach and I had my little four track cassette recorder and I went surfing 
And it was a crazy, foggy day, kind of one of those no-line-on-the-horizon days where you almost couldn't even see the waves coming because it was so thick, or if there was a guy, you know, 12 feet away from you, you, you couldn't even see him. Sometimes call it June gloom, but this this was like triple. This was heavy. It was like kind of unusual. And because of that, I think I was able to forget that there was other people around and I could really get into these these melodic ideas that I had in, in my head. And, and as soon as I got out in the water, I, I went right for the four track. I think just all in that one morning, it seemed strange. I think the first song was Alive, and then Once, and then there was another one called Footsteps. And then those kind of made a little storyline together. If you, if you put the three together, they, they kind of made a, a story. And that's what I sent up to the, the fellas, uh, Jeff and Stone, and, and then they asked if I would come up to Seattle. I mentioned to Jeff, I said, when I get there, can we just go right to the practice? Can we just go right to playing? Because I, I was just, to be honest, I was just so excited. I just wanted to hear it, just to hear it live and, and to hear that music live. I, I just I just couldn't wait. And that's what we did. We got into the basement of this little practice place they had and just started playing. This new friend to me, Dave Cruzen, on drums, and, and Mike McCready. So we had a few songs, and, and I remember singing and really <laughs> singing my heart out. And, and then it just turned into a magical, truly a, a crazy, unpredictably focused and more than you could ever wish for six, seven days on the planet. Because we played every day, maybe took a lunch break. Oh, they gave me a little room at the hotel down the street, so I stayed in the hotel, and I'd, and I'd work with the... I had my tape machine, and I'd I'd work on the instrumentals, and then write, and then sing new stuff the next day, and it was just a proper time of inspiration and release was just written. Stone probably started playing it. Everybody kind of fell in. I just kind of started writing on the microphone, and at the end of that song, I had to like walk up the stairs and. I, I, I like started weeping, you know. <laughs> it was so kind of intense. And I was getting stuff out that I really hadn't addressed for quite some time. I remember Jeff coming up like, are you doing okay? And I was like, yeah. Uh, kind of. <laughs> but it's good. It's all good. So we had all these songs by the end of five days and I think on the fifth day we played a show we opened for somebody at this small club or something or it was the sixth and then the seventh day we actually recorded and we, we did a demo of the eight songs or whatever it was or and then um, by the time I went home the next Sunday right back at the midnight shift and it, it was almost like it didn't happen at all except for I had this tape. And the tape that I had now was no longer an instrumental. <laughs> it was like the thing. It was like the band and and I was in it. I, I think maybe by the end of that week they said, yeah, um, if you want to move up here, we're, we're ready for you. <laughs> 